So let's now discuss about the most interesting standard of all. And I would say one of the most recent standard because the application started only from 1st April 2018. And this standard is about revenue from contracts with customers. Now, this standard in logical sense or in the language that it uses, it uses plainly a simple language, but don't compare it with AS9. AS1, AS9 was too plain a standard. Guys, understand that there was a definite requirement for a change in the standard. Now, if you'll ask me, sir, AS9 was already there. Why did India's uh, 115 come in? Why did Invade 116 come in when India 17 was already talking about leases? Even when we came into India's, AS9 was again broken down into India's 18 and India's 11. So these standards were already there. What was the requirement basically to bring about a new change and to include India's 115? I'll tell you. Today, the nature of transactions have significantly changed. Today, I'm saying on today's date, there is a significant change in the nature of the transactions which have occurred. Let me give you a brief idea of how there is a change in the nature of transaction and why does it require a change in the standard. Let's say for suppose, I hope everyone has ordered food on Swiggy, right? I hope everyone has at least ordered food on Swiggy at least once. I'm not going to tell you how to order the food. I'm just telling you what is the nature of transaction which occurs. Customer places an order with the Swiggy. list of restaurants are being displayed and among each restaurant the list of products that are, are that are being sold or dishes which are being sold the customer selects the order of a particular restaurant and he communicates to swiggy that this is my requirement swiggy after that will communicate the same thing to the restaurant the restaurant is communicated with the order The restaurant then sends an acceptance to Swiggy. That means they are accepting the order. Swiggy informs the acceptance to customer. This is how it happens, right? You place an order, it will say the restaurant has accepted the order. One notification comes up. Restaurant is preparing the order right now. Once the order is prepared, he will inform it to Swiggy saying that the order is ready for delivery. Now, once I say that the order is ready for delivery, then the restaurant is basically done with its duty. Then again, Swiggy will come into picture. Delivery executive will come into picture. And this restaurant gives it to the Swiggy delivery person. Swiggy delivery person gives it to the customer. Order is delivered. So this basically is a peculiar nature of how the transaction happens. So there is a pickup by the delivery executive from the restaurant. The delivery executive comes and gives it back to the customer. Now this is in a simple sense how the order happens on Swiggy. Correct? Everyone agrees on this? Let's say the order is placed for 100 rupees. I pay whom? I pay Swiggy 100 rupees. Swiggy received 100 rupees but once the restaurant has completed its service, Swiggy pays to the restaurant only rupees 75. He will deduct 25 rupees as commission and he will pay the remaining amount to the restaurant. Swiggy, again for the purpose of delivery, has charged me an additional of 20 rupees. Now, if I say, in essence, Swiggy collects 100 plus 20 rupees of delivery charges. 
that is total 120 he gives back to the restaurant 75 rupees that means in essence swiggy has received about 45 rupees from the transaction now my question is when should this 45 be recognized by swiggy let me tell you swiggy is entitled to receive 25 rupees on the total order from the restaurant as a commission income now when is the commission income arising when swiggy informed the order to the restaurant there itself swiggy's liar responsibility is over once the act order is accepted swiggy says yes i am now entitled to receive the 25 rupees of commission which i have to receive from the restaurant my obligation towards the restaurant is over my arrangement with the with the restaurant is that whenever customer places the order i will forward you the order once you accept the order i am entitled to receive a commission because i gave you a new customer so therefore swiggy will recognize revenue to the extent of 25 rupees once the restaurant has accepted that restaurant has to recognize a revenue to the extent of 75 when do they recognize they need not wait until the customer receives the delivery restaurant's obligation is completed once the delivery executive has picked up once i have picked up from the restaurant the obligation of the restaurant is complete so therefore restaurant recognizes revenue immediately at the point when the swiggy delivery executive comes picks up the order over my responsibility is finished now it is the delivery responsibility to make sure that the customer re receives that particular order swiggy has 20 rupees of additional revenue in this perspective this 20 rupees of additional delivery they will only they will only recognize as revenue when the order is delivered to the customer now you will say sir it is swiggy to whom i place that it is swiggy's responsibility to make sure that the order is delivered to me so entire thing is an obligation of swiggy only absolutely no to make sure that it is not swiggy's responsibility at the end of the delivery customer gets two ratings rate the delivery rate the restaurant he will give you two he never says rate the transaction so he is giving you a rating for the delivery he is asking you for a rating of the delivery also asking you the rating for the restaurant so that means what he is categorically hyphenating him he is removing his responsibility saying that restaurant is not mine the restaurant is owned by so many other people domino's kfc mcdonald's or any other other restaurant is owning it so the delivery of the product is my responsibility the quality of the product is the restaurant's responsibility so therefore in this particular instance if you look at swiggy swiggy in essence is recognizing a revenue of 45 rupees out of this 45 i will recognize 25 initially when the restaurant has accepted the customer's order because it is my commission which i am supposed to receive from the restaurant for transferring the order to the restaurant 25 immediately recognized but additional 20 rupees i will recognize as revenue when the their order is delivered to the customer because this 20 rupees of obligation is for delivery of goods to the customer that is how we basically hyphenate between these two logics clear look at the restaurant's perspective restaurant though you might have ordered 100 rupees of an item restaurant is not actually recognizing revenue to the extent of 100 restaurant will only recognize the revenue to the extent of 75 that is because he is only getting 75 rupees from the from swiggy and that also he will say that i will recognize the revenue not when the order is delivered to the customer but immediately when the order is picked up by the delivery executive because delivery is not my responsibility somewhere on the way the delivery executive have actually spilled the entire goods they are packed properly accident he met entire goods were spilled off it is not the restaurant's responsibility it is swiggy's responsibility because the obligation of the restaurant is completed immediately after he handed over the product the packed goods to the delivery executive so therefore the transaction on today's day have not been simple they are multi-party contracts or multi uh, uh, counterparty contracts which they have been entered in any good which is ordered on amazon is delivered to you by a delivery partner called as ecart 
eCart and Amazon, they are collectively taking the responsibility of making sure that the product is delivered to the customer. That is a collective counter ability of both the parties to make sure that the obligation towards the customer is met. If there is a problem with the delivery, I don't contact eCart. I directly contact Amazon. So that means Amazon is taking the responsibility of the delivery, but with the help of another counterparty to the contract called as eCart. So therefore, you need to understand that the transaction on today's day have become so complicated that you find that there is a significant difference in the way that the transaction should be looked at or in the way that the transactions of today actually occur. You find Red Bus, you find Ola, you find Uber, you find Swiggy. So many people who are basically acting as mediators. There are multiple point of revenues being recognized. So that is a reason why one has to understand that re recognizing revenue is not simple or not easy in general terms. In general terms. So for the purpose, you need to come up with this concept of India's 115. What is India's 115 actually talking about? And when it came in, what were the earlier standards which got replaced? Out of the earlier standards which got replaced by the introduction of India S115, they can be divided into five parts. India S115 was only with effect from 1st April 2018. It's a direct as it is copy paste of IFRS 15. IFRS 15 was applicable from 1st January 2018. So I started the application of India S115 starting from 1st April 2018. Three months of a gap, that's it. At that point of time when IFRS 15 was introduced, IFRS 15 basically replaced in your IFRS 15 with your, uh, sorry, your uh, standards which are replaced are IAS 11, which in our, in our index is called as Indias 11, Indias 18. 11 talks about construction contracts, 18 talks about revenue. Apart from this, they have also replaced SIC 31. This SIC 30, one second guys. Yes guys, so they have replaced all this. So they have replaced it with uh, uh, SIC 31, which is barter transactions in advertisement, where I place my advertisement in your website, you place your advertisement in my website. This is the transaction which is involving a barter transaction, which was dealt under SIC 31. IFRIC 13, IFRIC 15, IFRIC 18. IFRIC 13, IFRIC 15, IFRIC 18. These are the three IFRICs which were also to be read together with India S18 now no longer applicable after the introduction of India S115. What were these three talking about? 13 talks about customer loyalty program. You go to Shop Stop or Lifestyle, they'll give you some points. These are for recurring customers, they can actually redeem those points. These are called as customer loyalty program. IFRIC 15 talks about real estate transaction. They're generally of typical nature because they are having a longer period than a normal contract. And lastly, transfer of an asset to the customer. This is dealt in the form of consideration payable to the customer. Yes, consideration should move from the customer, no? Why should consideration be paid to the customer? We will discuss about this. There are some situations where there is a consideration paid to the customer. You buy boost, you get a bat free signed by Sachin Tendulkar or signed by Virat Kohli. So this is a consideration which I paid to the customer. So all these transactions put together, they got replaced with IFRS 15 or India's 15. Clear? Now, when I read the word customers, because the standard uses the word contract revenue from contract with customer. Who is a customer? A customer is a party who has contracted with the entity to receive goods and services, which are an output of entity's ordinary activities which is an output of entity's ordinary activities. What do you mean by this language? I'll tell you. A, a person is a customer only if he has contracted with an entity 
to receive an output of their entity's ordinary activities. Let's say the enterprise had a sale of a fixed asset. I've given an advertisement for a sale of a vehicle on OLX. A customer has approached me and now I have a contract with this customer to for the sale of my fixed asset. Can I call him as a customer under India's 115? Is that contract covered under India's 115? No, because a customer is only a party who has contracted with the enterprise to receive goods and services which are an output of entities ordinary activities. That sale of car is not your ordinary activity output. Therefore, even if there is a sale of car, the customer who is buying that car shall not be considered as a customer covered under India's 115. To be covered under India's 115, that customer should have contracted with an enterprise to obtain goods and services which are an output of entities ordinary activities and always in exchange of consideration. That means distribution as free samples will never come under the aspect of India's 115. There should always be a consideration which is attached to such contract where there is a transfer of goods and services to the customer. Here, so a party who has contracted with the enterprise to obtain goods and services which is an output of entities ordinary activities in exchange of consideration is called as a customer. Counterparties are not customers. What do you mean by counterparty? Counterparties are basically two parties who together perform a function or to together perform the obligation. They share the risk and rewards in discharging the obligation or in performing the obligation. Amazon and Ecart. I book a product on Amazon. Amazon packs the products and gives it to Ecart. Ecart is responsible for safety handling the product and delivering it to the customer. So both Amazon and Ecart are taking enough responsibility in delivering the customer uh, the product to the customer. So they share obligations, they share risk and rewards in delivery of obligation to the customer. Therefore, these counterparties among each other cannot be called as customers. Among each other, they cannot be called as customers. Restaurant and Swiggy, they together share risk and rewards in performance of an obligation towards the customer to a person who has placed the order. They cannot be called as customers to each other. So Swiggy and restaurant are counterparties to the contract. Their customer is completely different. Clear? What does the standard actually deal with? What is the objective of the standard? The objective of the standard is to recognize revenue and to discuss when to recognize the revenue and how to recognize the revenue. When to recognize the revenue? I will recognize the revenue in the manner in which the goods are transferred to the customer. The manner in which the goods are transferred to the customer. That is when I recognize revenue. How do I recognize revenue? To the extent of consideration which an entity expects to receive in exchange of goods and services from the customer. So what is the objective? The objective of the standard is to recognize revenue. While the scope of the standard deals predominantly with two questions. When, how, when, when, the, it, it, when is answered by this. Recognize revenue in the manner in which the goods are transferred to the customer. How the consideration which the entity expects to receive as an exchange for the goods and services transferred to the customer. Clear? This is fundamentally what the standard talks about or what is the scope of the standard? What is the overall perspective of the standard? Now, to recognize the revenue, I will undergo five steps. First step is to identify a contract with customer. Second step is to identify a performance obligation in the contract. Third step is to determine what is the transaction price. Fourth step is your step three transaction price should be allocated to performance obligations identified in step two. Allocation of transaction price identified in step three to each performance obligation identified in step two. Finally, step five to recognize revenue. I recognize revenue as or when the entity satisfies the performance obligation. 
as or when means what i'll recognize as the entity performs obligation that means over a period of time i'll keep on recognizing revenue when the entity satisfies performance obligation at a point of time i'll recognize the revenue so at a point of time over a period of time two types of revenues are recognized as per nds 115 so what are my steps in revenue recognition process first identify the contracts second identify performance obligations in this contract third one determine what is the consideration in the contract which is a transaction price step four this consideration has to be allocated to each performance obligation which i identified in step four uh, sorry to each performance obligation identified in step two that is your step four finally recognize revenue at a point of time or over a period of time based on when or as the entity performs its obligations under the contract this is in short the brief line outline of what the standard talks about yes i agree that these five steps have to be detailed and understood in step by step manner but in essence this is what the standard has the entire contents of the standard if i put it up in one slide then this is particularly the slide which i want So we have seen five steps in recognition of revenue. First one is the step one where we try to identify a contract with the customer. We have seen who is a customer, a party who, a party who has contract with, with an enterprise to receive an output of entities ordinary activities in exchange of some consideration. We have seen the customer part. But what is a contract? A contract is an arrangement. A contract is an arrangement between two or more parties to create legally enforceable rights and obligations. It is an arrangement between two or more parties to create legally enforceable rights and obligations. Now that is in essence what is a contract. But is that sufficient? I need certain something more. I need certain criteria for an arrangement to be called as a contract. An agreement can be called as a contract only if it satisfies five criteria. First one, the contract should have a commercial substance. What do you mean by commercial substance guys? Any idea what is a commercial substance? Commercial substance means the transaction should be of financial nature. Should be of financial nature. It is in my best finance interest to sell the product at a particular price. That is my commercial nature of transaction. I am distributing it as samples. I am donating the samples due to COVID relief. Now that cannot be considered as a commercial substance. Only if there is a commercial substance that is a considered to be a contract. So the first important criteria for identification of a contract is the essence that there should be a commercial substance to a contract. Number two, both the parties to the contract have approved the contract. Approved means they signed it. You said, okay. Even the customer said, okay. They are committed to perform the obligations under the contract. What is the commitment to perform obligations under the contract? The seller is committed to, dis, uh, to, committed to produce such goods which the customer requires 
and to deliver the goods that is my obligation what is the customer's obligation the customer's obligation is to pay consideration for the goods which are delivered so both the parties the seller and the customer have approved the contract and they are committed to perform their obligations under the contract clear third one each party has identified their rights and responsibilities in the contract number 4 they identify payment terms 50% advance 50% within 30 days from the date of delivery 100% advance 100% payment within 60 days from date of delivery these are payment terms within the contract lastly it is probable that the entity will collect consideration from the contract it is probable that the entity will collect consideration from the contract now what do you mean by probability that the entity will collect is it not certain probability can be established if the customer has an intention to pay if the customer has an intention to pay then only you can say that the fifth condition is satisfied that there is a probability that consideration will be received under the contract let's see a contract is an agreement between two or more parties which create legally enforceable rights and obligations what is the criteria for identification of contract first thing that the trans com the, the agreement should have some commercial substance number 2 the parties to have con to the contract have approved the contract and they are committed to perform their obligations under the contract it is a supplier's obligation to deliver goods and services to the customer it is a customer's obligation to pay consideration to the supplier under the contract so these are their respective obligations which each of the party is committed to perform third thing each each of the parties know what is their rights and responsibilities under the contract a supplier has a right to receive consideration the buyer is having a having a right to receive the delivery of the required good and service which has been communicated to the supplier number 4 they identify the payment terms that means they know what is the amount received and what is the duration within which the amount should be paid lastly it is probable that the entity will collect the consideration from the contract when do you say that it is probable only when the party has an intention as well as an ability to pay i have an intention to pay but i don't have an ability to pay you cannot say that the consideration is probable to be collected clear now sometimes there happens to be a situation where there is an executory contract what are executory contracts india is 37 india is 37 excludes executory contracts unless they are of onerous nature what is an executory contract an executory contract in simple sense means a contract in which both the parties to the contract have performed same amount of obligations or neither of the parties have done any obligation have performed any obligations under the contract i neither delivered the good the customer neither gave me them these are executory contracts so i am talking about such kind of executory contracts or wholly unperformed contracts if either the customer or the seller has a right unilateral right what do you mean by unilateral right that means the seller without consulting with the customer or the customer without consultation with the seller can cancel the contract they can cancel the contract without payment of damages to the other party i can cancel the contract without payment of damages to the other party then you can say that it is excluded such contracts are excluded under india's 115 what did i say where either of the party to the contract that means either the supplier or the customer have a unilateral right means what without communicating to the other party i myself have taken a decision to cancel this contract and such unilateral right to cancel does not have any obligation to pay damages to the other party then you can say that such contracts are not included within the definitions of india's 115 those contracts will not come under india's 115 clear now 
sometimes there happens to be a situation where two or more contracts are entered at the same time or near the same time. What is at the same time or near the same time? At the same time or near same time basically means that basically uh, that in a sense that these these contracts are either entered together. Let's say one contract A has been entered on 1st April and the other contract B was also entered on 1st April. That means they are entered at the same time. What do you mean by near the same time? Near the same time means one contract entered into on 1st of April. Other contract entered into on 4th of April. They are near the same time. When two contracts are entered into almost at the same time or exactly at the same time, there is a possibility for you to combine these contracts. Now my question is, when should I combine the contract? Let me tell you. Let's say the contract is for it's a development of two thousand square yards land. The contract involves construction of three tasks. The contract involves construction of three tasks. All three are residential tasks. There is a tower A, there is a tower B and there is a tower C. I have entered into an agreement for tower A. on let's say 1st April 21. Similarly, I also entered into construction of Tower B contract on 4th of April 2021. Even the Tower C agreement was also drafted on 15th April 2020. So that means these agreements are entered into near the same time. Such contracts, can I combine them? I can combine these three. They can be treated on combination basis or I can treat all these three contracts as combined into one single contract if they are negotiated as a single package. What do you mean by negotiation as single package? Negotiation as single package means there is no chance, there is no chance that the customer could have given the agreement for tower A without taking up the construction of tower B and tower C. My company X Limited has received the contract of tower A alone. Tower B and C were allotted to some other party. Then you cannot say that they are negotiated as a single package. They are negotiated as a single package only when all the three contracts are necessarily to be done by the same party. It is not possible to basically grant part of the contract to one party and the remaining parts of the contract to another party. Then you can say that they are negotiated as a single package. First condition. So, first con condition I was talking about. I said... They are negotiated as a single package next one second condition the price of one contract is based on or influenced by the price and performance of the other contract The price of performance is 
is influenced by other contracts i have given you contract a therefore at the time of contract c i requested you for 8% discount why did you offer me a discount because anyways you are only doing tower a you are only doing tower c there is a significant added advantage to you so i am expecting you to make sure that the same rates of tower a are taken but you give me a discount of 8% so the price and performance of one contract influences the price and performance of another contract lastly they signify a single performance obligation all three together they should signify a single performance obligation what do you mean by they signify single performance obligation? That means the customer will benefit only if all the three are produced or constructed together. I construct A, I don't construct B and C, the customer cannot take the benefit. The customer can only occupy A, B or C only when they are performed or constructed together. Therefore, it is simplified, it, it signifies a single performance obligation. So whenever I talk about combination of contracts, I am saying that if contracts are entered into at the same time or near the same time, they can be combined only if number one, they are negotiated as a single package. Price and performance of one contract is depending or influences the price and performance of other contracts. The goods and services under all these contracts represent a single performance obligation. If these three conditions together are satisfied, then you can say that they can be treated as a single contract. But if they are not satisfied, then you have to treat it as a separate contract. Clear? Clear? So this is a very simple understanding. I gave you an example and I told you. Now, I'll go back to the previous example itself and I'll do some small modifications. I wanted you to construct Mm, additional work. What additional work? I wanted you to construct a park. I wanted you to construct an overhead tank. I wanted you to construct a small clubhouse where a gym facility and other facilities are also included. These contracts I gave you subsequently. Initially I gave you ABC but subsequently I have done some modifications to the contract to include few more items into the contract like a park or a tank or a clubhouse or any other things. Or let's say for example I said you, you can use any sort of plane paint but later on i told you you have to use only apex ultima from asian paints i said you can use vetrified tiles for c for your flooring but later on i told you i don't i want only a marble flooring this way i might have given you multiple contracts this way i might have actually added or modified the contract can this modification on the contract be treated as the same contract or these additional assets should they be treated as a new contract I will treat these modifications as a new contract only if these assets are distinct from the other assets. These assets or modifications which happen are distinct from the assets which are already negotiated in the original contract. Park, tank, clubhouse are distinct from the towers of A, B and C. They are distinct in their function, they are distinct in their construction, they are distinct in everything. And the price or modification which happened in the contract is almost equal to the standalone selling price of these contracts. If they have not been given to me, but they have been given to someone else, 
even he would have charged the same amount. That means they represent a standalone selling price of these items. In such cases, we can classify them as a separate contract. So I'm talking about something called as modifications to the existing contract. If the modification represents distinct goods and services from original contract, here park, clubhouse, water tank, all these are distinct from the original contract. And the change in the contract price is the standalone selling price of the modification. In such case, the modification should be treated as a separate contract. In any other situation, the it should be treated as a modification to the original contract itself. Here, so we have seen regarding combination of contracts for contracts which are entered into at the same time or near the same time. We have also seen modifications in contract where a particular change in the contract can be treated as a separate contract or should it be treated as a change in the original contract. Now let's get into step two. What is a performance obligation? What do you mean by a performance obligation first of all? Okay, so what do you mean by performance obligation? So we are looking at step two. We have already done with step one, identifying a contract with the customer. Now you tell me, what do you think about a performance obligation in a contract? The supplier has an obligation to deliver the goods and services as requested by the customer. The customer has an obligation to pay the consideration as agreed upon. So therefore, every contract has an obligation there is an obligation of the supplier there is also an obligation of the customer now here under step two i am only talking about the obligations of the supplier i am not talking about the consideration which the customer has to pay so i am only talking about what is the obligations which the, the, the supplier has to perform under a particular contract let's say a customer has purchased an ac from Amazon okay the Amazon executive came one day as has delivered the AC did the AC by itself give you any benefit you have delivered the AC I plugged in the AC did the AC work no the AC has to be installed there has to be an outdoor unit which has to be kept outside there should be an indoor unit which is placed so many things are there 
So therefore, by the delivery alone, the customer did not benefit from the good. Therefore, the obligation of the supplier is not restricted to just supplying that particular equipment. The obligation of the supplier is to install that equipment and make sure that you test on it saying that yes, I can find that there's a, the AC is working. I put my hand up and I check whether there is a cool air which is blowing or not. And I say yes, supplier's obligation is complete. Yeah, I take examples which are easy for you to see in your room. In your room, you can find all these examples which I'm talking about. Construction of towers, wherever I gave you the example, as simple as that. Any locality you look at, you find so many towers coming up. All these are taking examples which you can see right here. In front of you, you can see these items. So that's why I take these kind of examples so that it will be easier for you to relate to it. So that's why I gave you the example of an AC. Why? Forget about AC, even television set, right? Even TV set also, it has to be wall mount. So what you do? You take the delivery of their TV and you wait for it. The next day you get a message that the consultant is going to reach you and he is going to install the TV set. So he'll drill some holes. He will hang the TV onto the wall and he'll say that installation is complete. So therefore my purchase of that particular equipment had an obligation to the supplier, not just for the delivery of the item, but also certain additional conditions attached to it. Certain additional conditions which are attached to it. So therefore, the obligation under a contract to the supplier, which is called as performance obligation, is a promise. What is your promise? Supplier's promise to deliver, it, to deliver distinct goods and services within a contract. It is my promise to deliver distinct goods and services within a contract. If they are distinct, then each obligation will be treated as a separate performance obligation. If they are not distinct, then they should be treated as one single performance obligation. So my promise in the contract to deliver distinct goods and services under a contract or a series of distinct goods and services where each of such goods also satisfies performance obligation. They have a same pattern of transfer to customers. So let me see what is performance obligation. It is a promise in the contract to transfer goods and services or a bundle of goods and services which are distinct. What is this distinct? I'll tell you. Or a series of distinct goods and services which are substantially same and have a same pattern of transfer to the customer. I will park this aside. I will discuss about what is a series of distinct goods and services which are substantially same, have a same pattern of transfer to the customer. I'll park this part aside. I'll first deal with the first part. What is he saying? A promise to transfer goods and services or a bundle of goods and services which are distinct. When can I say that there are multiple goods and services in the contract which are distinct from each other? I will say that the contract has multiple goods and services which are distinct only if such goods and services in the contract can benefit the supply, uh, can benefit the customer by itself. By itself, the good can give a benefit to the customer. Let's say for example, I have delivered you a tube light. A tube light was delivered to you. So, when a tube light is delivered to you, I assume that you already have a light holder. So, you go and place this tube light there, automatically the light starts glowing. This is a distinct good. The good by itself generates some benefit to the customer, either by itself or with other resources which are readily available. What is the other resource which is readily available? The tube light holder. When I say readily available, that means something which the customer already owns or something which the customer can buy from the open market. It need not be only from me. It, he can buy it from any person. It is readily available in active market. Then you can say that it is a distinct good. A distinct good or service either gives a benefit to the customer by itself or can give a benefit to the customer with resources which are readily available. Readily available resources are those resources which the customer already owns or he can buy it from open market. I went to a supplier for a tire of my vehicle. 
I gave him what is my tires. He delivered the tires and he said, sir, take, go. Did the tire by itself give me any benefit? No. But it will give me a benefit with a resource which is already existing with me, which is my car. So they can be called as distinct goods and services. I can also call a good or a service distinct. I can also call a good or service distinct if they are separately identifiable. What do you mean by a good or service which is separately identifiable? It is not dependent. It is not highly dependent and interrelated with other goods and services supplied within the contract. There is no significant integration which happens with other goods and services supplied in the contract. And there is no significant customization which happens with other goods and services supplied within the contract. Then you can say that they are separately identifiable. That they are separately identifiable. What do you mean by distinct good or service? A customer benefits from the good or service alone or together with other goods and services which are readily available. What do you mean by readily available? Such good is already owned or such good will be sold separately. Or they are separately identifiable. There is no highly, they are not highly dependent or interrelated. There is no significant integration. There is no customization which occurs with other goods and services which are supplied within the contract. Then you can say that these goods and services in the, which are supplied as a part of the contract are distinct from each other. Each such distinct good or service should be treated as a separate performance obligation. For example, okay. for example, I have a mobile phone which is purchased. A supplier of the mobile phone has supplied me the mobile phone in addition when I was checking out. When I was checking out, he said you can add, you can add your RAM from 64 GB to uh, 256 GB by paying an additional price, so and so additional price. Number one. Number two, the cover of this mobile phone so that it, it avoids any breakage when there's a fall. This cover is additionally provided at 500 rupees. Okay. Now these additional goods and services, are they distinct or should they, all the, the things could be combined together to be considered as one single performance obligation. Now look at it. When I increased my RAM or my mobile memory from 64 to 256 GB at the time of purchase, the additional money which I pay, can that particular increase in the RAM can be offered even by an external person? Is it possible? No. Then the increase in the RAM should be considered as a same good as the mobile phone is. But this mobile cover which I am purchasing from the supplier, I can purchase it from anywhere else as well. There are so many, uh, you know, uh, websites which offer services for purchasing these mobile phone covers. Therefore, this, pop, uh, this particular mobile phone cover can be considered as a distinct good, cannot be combined with the mobile phone by itself. Clear? So these are goods and services which are distinct. That means they benefit the customer by themselves or they benefit the customer with other resources which are readily available. What do you mean by readily available? They can, they can be sold separately or they are already obtained by the customer or if there is, if they can be separately identified. This was my first part where goods and services are distinct. But look at the second one. There are series of distinct goods and services. That means you are not delivering one single good or service. Multiple times you are delivering a distinct good or service. But they're substantially same, they're very much the same and they have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. Best example that you can take here is your newspaper. Each day newspaper, the newspaper on 1st April is irrelevant or distinct from the newspaper given on 2nd of April. It is distinct from the newspaper delivered on 3rd of April. Because the news that it carries are significantly different and is only relevant for that particular day. Today's newspaper, tomorrow's waste paper. So what is happening? They are series of distinct goods and services. But 
substantially they are same because they deliver that day's news and it is generally printed in the same format. There is no significant difference in these items. They are substantially same, but they are distinct goods and services. But last part I'm talking about, they have the same pattern of transfer to customer. What do you mean by this word? They have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. Now this word has to be explained. When I use the word same pattern of transfer, each such distinct good or service, which is supplied as a part of performance obligation, they should meet the criteria of performance obligation. And secondly, a same method is applied to measure the entity's progress towards the completion of performance obligation. What do you mean by this? I have supplied 10 days of newspaper out of your 365 days of subscription. Out of your 365 days of subscription, I have completed 10 days of delivery. What do you mean? What happens here? That means my measurement of performance obligation completion is 10 by 365. I've completed 150 days of delivery out of 365 days of subscription. So 150 by 365 is my obligation which is completed. So a same measure or same method is applied towards the entity's progress on completion of performance obligation. This is same pattern of transfer to customer. So a promise in the contract to transfer a good or a service or a bundle of goods and services which are distinct or a series of goods and services which are substantially the same have a same pattern of transfer to customer. Clear? This is my second part that is identification of performance obligation. First part we identified a contract. Second part we identified performance obligation. Now we'll have to move into step three where we determine transaction price.